My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to introduce our guest this evening. Also known for her hilarious lip-syncing videos of Donald Trump sound bites, Sarah Cooper is the author of 100 Tricks to Appear Smart in Meetings and How to Be Successful Without Hurting Men's Feelings, and star of the Netflix comedy special, Sarah Cooper, Everything's Fine. She is currently working on an upcoming Netflix comedy titled Unfrosted with Jerry Seinfeld. Named one of Variety's 10 comics to watch, she has more than 3 million followers across social media. She joins us this evening with her new memoir, Foolish. She'll be joined in conversation with comedian Chanel Ali. Please welcome Sarah Cooper and Chanel Ali to the Free Library. Hello, how are you? Feeling good? Thank you so much for coming. It's so good to see all of you. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, welcome to In Conversation with Sarah Cooper. Well, congratulations are in order. This is a hilarious book, thank and you. thank you so much for sharing it with us. Well, thank you. Thank you for letting me write it. <laughs> I, I got to start by saying that I love that this is called foolish, and I can tell that that's a word that you love. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I had this whole concept um, of, you know, the fact that I was making fun of this fool in the White House, and I was um, playing the fool, and, uh, but also that, you know, 100 Tricks to Appear Smart in Meetings, a lot of times I live this life of, <laughs> of being smart all the time and it was a burden and um, I didn't want to be I don't want to be smart anymore you know I want to I want to be a fool I want to do foolish things I want to live my life you know? so, I love it and foolish yeah. is one of my favorite words I mean you will see it everywhere from now on because <laughs> I anytime I read anything now it's like fool foolish foolish I mean I think it's a moment it's gonna be a moment yeah yeah, I love it. It's along the lines with like silly. Silly and also just like not taking yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, as an immigrant coming here, I just tried to fit in so much. I tried yeah. to do everything perfectly and be perfect and say the right thing all the time. And that worked really well in corporate world, you know? I, I bet. It, you know, you get into a meeting and that you nod and you take notes and you draw a Venn diagram and you look really smart. Um, <laughs> and um, once I got into sort of the entertainment world, being on a set, you have to take chances. You have to, you have to look like an ass in order to be even remotely interesting. Yeah. Um, looking smart, being robotic, playing by a script, nobody wants to see that. Perfection is boring. Perfection is death. Absolutely. That's not a joke. Well Stop said. laughing. <laughs> well said. Let's be a little foolish tonight. You know what that means. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I, I love so many parts of this book, and it feels like you're talking to us, you know? Yeah. And not in a way where it's like, everybody sit down and shut up, because I have so many things to say. It's very much like, isn't this crazy that I'm talking to you? <laughs> you know, it's light and fluffy. Yeah. I wanted it to be light. I mean, that was the kind of the thing with 2020 was, and I hear this a lot, is like, it was a hard time to laugh for a lot of people. And yeah. people come up to me and they say, you know, it was a time when I didn't think I could laugh at anything. And this was the most serious thing that was happening. And it was really, really hard to have any levity whatsoever. Um, and uh, that's kind of what I wanted to do with the book. Take a lot of serious topics, things that I wanted to talk about that, you know, maybe um, other people would sort of cringe at and things I've even cringed at um, and sort of find the humor in them. Um, you know, I talk about, you know, miscarriage and things like that, which is like a very serious topic. Um, but, you know, when you're told you're going to have a miscarriage when you're trying to get an abortion, that's hysterical. You know, that's really <laughs> funny. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I love it. And also, I love that we get to peek inside of Sarah Cooper's diary when she was a child. Yeah, yeah. And one thing that's so interesting to me is that it almost doesn't sound like a diary of a child. It sounds like a little adult studying children. I know. It does. Can I tell you that I auditioned... Have you, have you all ever heard of... Um, Mortified. It's where people read their, their childhood diaries. I auditioned for that. 
And they rejected me because they said I, sa I didn't sound like a child. <laughs> yes. um, because I was talking about my brother going off to Iraq and, you know, all of these, like, serious things. And I was observing people at the Poison concert. Like, everybody has their hands like this. <laughs> and, they're, and they're doing this. Yeah. And, you know, um, the <laughs> Ricky Rockets... Uh, drum set says "fuck Iraq," and <laughs> and Bush made a really good speech. I think it was really good. I was a little Republican. I was just really I was I was headed down the, a bad path. I really was. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I don't know. I I guess yeah. I don't know. I think I just I I spent a lot of time inside my room um, by myself. You know, I was really really close to my sister Rachel when we were growing up. We were a year and a half apart. And my mom made all our clothes and dressed us exactly the same. And everywhere we went, people were like, oh, you're twins. And then we would say, yeah, we're twins, because we got more attention that way. And so we'd be like, yeah, we're twins. And then at a certain point, um, we found out that Rachel had a learning disability. And so she was um, you know, put, taken, put into a different school. And then all of a sudden, I found myself like, oh, I want to have these deep conversations. I want to talk about these observations I'm making. And I, I didn't know where to go with that. And so I went to my journal with them. Um, but I also think that Rachel and I learned to communicate in other ways, which um, helped me later, which is that I think I made faces at her. I think yeah. I, that's kind of how I, I sort of learned to use my face to sort of communicate with her. And she loves being silly. She has no trouble being silly and being foolish and having fun. And as I got older, especially in my 20s, I found it really hard to relate to her because I wanted to be so smart. And I was working in tech now and I was doing all this. And now being 45, I'm like, oh my God. Like, I just, I love... I love connecting with her and trying to relate to her more because I realize now she like has it figured out. You know, mm. she has it figured out. Don't take anything too seriously. And yeah, so I think I've been talking too much. <laughs> oh no, you're fine. It's literally <laughs> your job while you're here. <laughs> Lots of people came and they want to hear more words from you. Words, um, words, words, more words, <laughs> and more words. Do you think that um, making your because you made a lot of your siblings laugh, but definitely yeah. making Rachel laugh was like your first acting. I think it was, and I think because Rachel laughed so easily, like mm. she, and she, to this day, you know, she will laugh and tears will be coming down her face and she'll be like, Rachel, you're, you have to breathe, you know, she just <laughs>, laughs so much. And um, it gave me this high a little bit to make her laugh. It made me feel really, really good. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that it, that's sort of where that came from. And my father was such an authoritarian in my household. It was almost like if we could make him laugh, we were okay. Oh, you yeah. know, like then if, you got something really good. Yeah. Uh, well, no, we just got dinner that wasn't, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> awkward or tense. Um, so, you know, and then I heard dads love my videos. And then I was like, oh, dads love everything that I do for some reason. And it's because I was making fun of my dad to make him laugh. Mm -hmm. So that's where some of that humor comes from. So I feel like it's those two things sort yeah. of together. Yeah. And you come from Jamaican parents. Yeah. Who well, came... I'm Jamaican too. You're Jamaican too. That's, that's true. She's Jamaican, everybody. Uh, <laughs> don't call her anything else. I was just talking to my doorman the other day who's Jamaican. Every time I tell him I'm Jamaican, he's like, yeah, but you weren't born there. And I'm like, yes, I was. I was born there. I came here when I was three. And he's like, oh, OK, I guess okay. that's Jamaican. Everybody, island girl right Mia here. Yeah, island girl, man. Cha. Yeah. But I, I, I bring it up to say that to try to be an artist, especially a comedic artist, yeah. when you have immigrant parents, yeah. is a mountain. Yeah, it it's is. something that you have to climb. Yeah. Because immigrant parents come to America and they're like, I need you to read every book yeah. to justify this trip so that you can eventually take care of yourself yeah. and I will have somebody to speak highly of when mm -hmm. I check in with the neighbors. Yes, yes. So I can't imagine that it was easy to watch TV with them and see yourself on TV and see yourself in certain characters and not be able to express it until you got older. Yeah, I mean, I remember we, we would watch TV and my dad would never sit and like watch it with us. He thought we were wasting time, like if we weren't being productive. I remember this one time, me and my sisters were eating ice cream. I think I was probably like six or something. And we were making faces in the ice cream and then I was like making voices with like the faces that we were making. And my dad was just, just eat your ice cream, you know, <laughs> just eat it. 
there's no playing, you know? Playing is bad. Um, it was all about getting, being productive. And he always wanted us to be productive. Yeah. And it's like you said, like they wanted us to have a 401k. Like yeah. that was the goal, have a 401k, you know, have real estate, that was the goal. So to be like, no, I just wanna like, I wanna be on stage and I wanna play Juliet, you know, that, that didn't seem like a good goal to yeah. have um, for them. Um, and my dad really, really pissed me off once. Like I did a bunch of theater in high school and then gave it up and then, you know, my life is kind of like a tennis game. It's just like the back and forth and back and forth between entertainment and tech and entertainment and tech. And at age 30, I quit my job. I was like, I wanna be an actress. I gotta try this one more time. And I did this play, a Neil Simon play, and my dad came to see it and he said, I think you are better in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you didn't support me then either, Dad. <laughs> like, so at some point you realize, like, you know, they're just, they have their own idea of success. Yeah. And you have, to, you have to find what it is for you because their idea of it isn't going to make you happy. Um, and, yeah, my, my literary agent, Susan, was just asking me, hi. It's like, <laughs> are they going to read the book? No, they're not going to read the book. <laughs> They're not going to read the book. <laughs> I think that's probably true, but yeah. <laughs> they will no. still be proud of you from, uh, you know, they, the reviews. The, <laughs> the, pri the pride comes from the success. Once they saw yeah. that I was successful, then they were like, oh, there might be something here. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you did a good thing, you know? So it, it's like, you know, when I hear about, like, you know, other actors or people, like, if you have kids, please be supportive of their dreams. I guess that's the point. Yes. Just be supportive of them because a lot of times, you know, I, I, I sometimes feel a little, like when I did the play, The Wanderers, um, at Roundabout Theater Company, um, I, my dressing room I shared with Lucy Frere, who went to Juilliard, four years at Juilliard, Australian, um, and on opening night, her side of the room was covered in flowers, just covered. <laughs> My side of the room <laughs> had like one bouquet from WME, like just <laughs> like that was it. Um, yeah. And I, you know, it was like things like that where it's just like, you know, like that support mm -hmm. is really, really great. And so not having the support just means that you have to lean on yourself a whole lot more. And I'm not saying that my parents aren't supportive. They are really, really supportive. Love them to death, especially if they're listening, which they're not. So it's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, support your, support your kids' dreams. Yeah. And your grandkids' dreams. And, you, and, and you your cousins' dreams. <laughs> <laughs> you heard her. <laughs> You guys better be leaving here to go support somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you say that it was hard to grow up being Jamaican and having a name like Sarah Cooper? Yeah, it was. It yeah. really was. You wish you had a name like? Marjorie. I, don't know. <laughs> um, I didn't know what you were going to say. I don't know. Yeah, Sarah. Yeah, like my, um, yeah, I write about in the book about how, well, I didn't really have a name when I was first born, they didn't know what to call me. They thought I was gonna be a boy, so they were gonna name me David. And um, <laughs> then I came out and I was a girl and they were like, we don't know what to name her. We don't have any other name for her. Let's go home. Um, so <laughs> back to the drawing board, I guess. <laughs> um, and then a you know family friend picked me up and instinctively called me Sarah. And I think at that moment, the ghost of a basic bitch named Sarah moved into my body <laughs> and just gentrified my whole personality, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so then that's, you know, from, from that moment on, like my mom would cook jerk chicken and I couldn't eat it because it was too spicy for me. You know, I couldn't eat it. Yeah. Um, so I, the Sarah has followed me around. It's been great in that, like you see Sarah Cooper and you don't think of this, you mm. know, um, well maybe you do now, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it's also been like, yeah, just very, you know, I could be a character on the OC, you know, like I just, yeah. yeah. And it's easier for kids to make fun of you if you have like a two-syllable name. It's just easier to yeah. be like Sarah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I got I got Sarah Cooper Pooper Scooper. That's what I got. Now Aww. kids, that's that's what did it for you guys. That's what made you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> some kids aren't good writers, and there's, yeah. there's only some. That's what they're awing about the bad writing. <laughs> it's cliche, Mark. <laughs> I think that. Um, especially in America, even if you have immigrant parents or if you don't and you come from just black Americans, um, society and the media teaches us a lot about what type of black is cool, what type of black is 
acceptable. Mm. And it doesn't leave space for various <laughs> types of black, <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. And I think that um, in becoming an artist, we often have to be the first of our kind. Yeah, yeah. And did you feel that way when you were little too? Did you feel like, oh, I don't really fit in with some of these black kids. I don't fit in with some of these white kids. Maybe I'm my own thing. Yeah, I mean, my, my parents, we, we moved around a lot because my parents are very good at investing, very good at real estate, very good at, so we would, we, the first house we had when we moved here was a rental, then we moved to another rental, then we bought a house, then we bought a bigger house, then we kept moving, and the neighborhoods just got whiter and whiter and whiter <laughs> and, until I was the only black kid in AP history. And, um, <laughs> and I would always get the question, what are you? What are you? That's the question I would get. And I wouldn't even know what to say. I'd yeah. be like, I, and then I'd ask my parents, like, what am I? And they'd say, well, you're Jamaican, you know? <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, I'm not black. I don't know what that, I don't think, I'm, am I black? Am I, am I Jamaican? What does that mean? Yeah. Um, and then um, I talk about this in the book, about how I was um, walking home uh, from the bus stop with my best friend, Stacy, who was Jewish. She still is. And... Um, <laughs> she told me that one of the older kids called her an N-word lover. And I said, why would they call you that? And she said, because my best friend is black. And I said, I thought I was your best friend. <laughs> and she said, you are. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? And she's like, you're black. And I went home to my parents and I was like, I think we're black. <laughs> and they were like, no, we're Jamaican. And I was like... I think you're black too. I think our whole family's <laughs> black. I think I opened this yeah. completely wide open. Like I've I've done it. Solved the case. I've solved the case. And um, we we were talking backstage about 23 and Me. You know, like my ex husband yeah. wanted to do that because I think he really he was he's really white. He's like white. He's like really white. Um, <laughs> but he, and he was I, searching. He was trying to find something else. He was trying to find some spice in there. And he, he was trying to like I I think I'm. And then it was just like it came back white. Like yeah. it literally was like that's all it said. Yeah. Um, they just sent him a blank paper. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a white sheet of paper. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and it's just you know I'm just mixed with a lot of different things. But yeah. yeah. Also being well read and how we speak as a certain black person. Like there's certain things that. They don't slip off our tongue as easily as a yeah. kid from Harlem, you yeah. know? And I know you say in the book that you don't really say the N-word. I didn't start saying the N-word until I was in college, you know? It took a while until really? I got my credit up, you know? Really? Yeah. yeah. It took a while, yeah. See, I think, I think that's the interesting thing is, like, sometimes people say you can say the N-word if you're black. That gives you a pass. Yeah. But I, do, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. I actually think it's a vibe. It is a vibe! It's like you have to have the right vibe in order to mm -hmm. say it. And when I say it, people are like, that's not the right vibe. Like, they are, <laughs> like, please don't ever say that ever again. Um, and I did it in the audio book. I do. Oh, you do? I say it. I, I got to hear it. <laughs> it's, it's not great because I was, um, I was on the train, um, like, earlier this year, and um, these five black and brown teenagers, boys, came on and sat all around me, and they were just throwing the N-word around back and forth. And I took my mask down very calmly, and I was like, can you guys teach me how to say the N-word? And, um, Very bold of you to speak to teens yeah. on New York City subway yeah. and ask for lessons on language. I did. I did. And they, were like, they got very excited. They were, they like, were like, we've been waiting for this all day. <laughs> all day. They Is were like, your name Sarah? <laughs> Is your name Sarah? Get in here, Sarah. You're cool now. Yeah. They were like, say it, say it. You can say it. So I tried to say it. They were like, you can't say it. They were like, yeah. we were wrong. Yeah. And now we've taken part in something we hate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is really hard, and it, it has to be the vibe, and you, you have to work hard. I think, honestly, it's just from, a lot, of, a lot for me was just standing up to people. You get to a certain point where you're like, I'm just out here. And just out here. Yeah, and I can say can it really say, early. Can you say dead ass? Psh, dead ass. See? Psh, dead ass, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I gave her the psh, <laughs> so you can use that next time. If you want to jump into something, psh. just say psh first, Stunt. and everybody will be right on board. What about, what about stunting? Okay. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, this is being live streamed right now, so <laughs> next time you want to try a word, let's clear it with me first. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I mean, this is my hood. <laughs> no, I, I love this book so much, and I think you're so vulnerable in it, and you talk about your relationships and dating. It is so hard to be 
a female powerhouse in any industry. Oh my God, have. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard, yeah. but it's even harder to then find a partner that can handle what you're doing. Yeah. And so you had relationships at so many different periods of your success. Are you calling me old? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not. These were recently, you just did this. <laughs> I can't imagine that it was easy to be married to someone when you're watching yourself become a star. Yeah. It was, and they yeah. are sitting next to you and also having a reaction to it. Yeah. That isn't the same. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I, um, I, I talked about this in um, an interview earlier um, a few weeks ago about how I was at the weakest point in my life when all of that was happening in 2020. And um, I don't think I explained it, but I want to like try to. It's basically like I was in a marriage with someone who wasn't right for me at all. I sort of outsourced all my decisions on everything with it, to him, you yeah. know. Um, and that's you know, there's a chapter called "The Immigrant to Basic Bitch Pipeline," and I be, I was I I didn't have I didn't know what what I was wearing I didn't know I didn't have any sense of style I, I didn't have any sense of like who I was and so then I had all of this attention on me and you know this when you get to this like stage where people are looking at you they want to know who you are like yeah. in entertainment they don't have specific meetings they have general meetings yeah. right um, and I was like, what the hell is a general meeting? <laughs> because in tech, there's an agenda and there's action items. Absolutely. And you know what I mean? Someone emails you afterward, you know, like there's yeah. things that happen, but in entertainment, it's just like, tell us about yourself. And I was like, I don't know who I am. <laughs> I, I don't, I literally don't. I, I knew that I wanted to be in comedy. I knew I loved entertaining. I knew I loved performing and all of that, but I didn't know like who, I didn't know like really what's my, what's my vibe? Like mm -hmm. who am I really? And so a lot of the things that I was doing, I was like excited to do them, I was grateful to do them, but I would get in these meetings and I would just kind of say what I thought they wanted to hear, mm -hmm. which is not what they want to hear. No, they want to hear your wildest dreams. They want to hear the wildest, craziest, yeah. they want to hear foolish things. Absolutely. You know what I mean? That's what they want to hear. And I couldn't give that to them because I was terrified of saying the wrong thing, of doing the wrong thing, of pissing off the wrong person, you know? Yeah. So um, that's what I meant, like, it's the weakest moment in my life because I, was buried behind all of this people pleasy bullshit. You know, I was yeah. just sort of buried behind all of that. And it took, it took asking for a divorce and to get out of all of that. I also think it's interesting that you always say you worked up the courage to ask for a divorce. Like it's a question. Yeah. They're gonna give you the divorce. We don't, they don't no. get a choice. No. We're getting divorced. Yeah. I wish I had been there in your life to say, <laughs> stop asking. <laughs> We're getting divorced. I asked for so many things, like even the apartment, like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's, you know, I, I wanted to move back into our place, and I asked, and I told my sister that. She's like, why did you ask? You should have yeah. just done it. And I was like, no, I wanted, I needed, I was a permission whore, I mm. guess. You know, I just yeah. wanted permission, permission. Someone tell me it's okay that yeah. I do this, you know? And that was really interesting, too, because you divorce this guy, you guys move out of this apartment, and then you decide... I actually want to stay in that apartment. I yeah. actually love the apartment. The apartment wasn't the problem. Yeah, the apartment. It was the guy in yeah. the linen that he wouldn't allow to go in the linen closet. Yes, yes. And we got to get him out of here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's that's really bold of you. Even if you did ask, it was very bold of you to do it. Thank you. But also, that apartment was where you filmed a lot of these lip sync videos, right? No. No. So you were in a, a Brooklyn apartment. I was. We were in a windowless Brooklyn apartment. Okay in 2020, and I, that's where I was filming those videos. Yeah. And um, my mom, who's, you know, she's Jamaican, she loves the sun, so she, I was like, I don't think Jeff's happy. You know, I kept saying, I don't know if he's happy. I think he's, you know, midlife crisis or something. And she's like, well, is he getting enough sun? Wow. You know, that's... <laughs> She That's what our marriage it. needs. She yeah. diagnosed it. Yeah, she, she... Is he taking vitamin D? <laughs> yes, Because we gotta get, we gotta get it. Um, so I was like, okay, maybe we'll move into an apartment with some windows. Mm. Um, so in 2021, <laughs> I was like, this is the last ditch effort, effort to save this marriage. We'll move into this apartment with some windows. We're going to get him a tan. We're and then gonna <laughs> this is going to work somehow. Yes. We'll, we'll, We're going to we'll color that white piece of paper in <laughs> with something. Right. We will connect um, over moisturizer. Yeah. Um, so we're in this apartment, this beautiful apartment with these windows. 
and he has the lights on. And I'm like, we don't need the lights on with the sun coming in, so I turn the light switch off, and he gets mad at me for turning the light switch off. Yeah. And for the first time in the eight years that I'd been with him, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, <laughs> just be happy. Like, turn the light off. It's yeah. fine. And that was, the, that was like the light switch moment of just like, you know, <laughs> this isn't working. That yeah. was like the first thing of this isn't working. Even if I was arguing the man with a man and the sound of the light switch was going off and on, I would start to consider what's going on in my life, you know? <laughs> Maybe we do need to rethink this. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I really don't care about the light switch. I just want to be happy. You mm -hmm. know, that's what I said. And um, then we, fr like for the first time, started talking about the divorce and... It's just so ironic that I was, f I was filming the pilot for how to be successful without hurting men's feelings <laughs> when I looked back at my journals and realized, oh my God, I need to get out of this. Yeah. yeah. When you think back about filming those lip sync videos, you know, you had to do a few things before you actually sent, sent it out to the world, you know? Yeah. You put on a little makeup or you put on a blazer and then you switched your hair, put on a little bang for yeah. this one. You know, those steps, every step, took a second of bravery, you know? Mm. A second of foolishness to decide, I just had this thought and I'm going to do it. Yeah. Do you think you were actively making those decisions or do you think you were kind of in this zone where you were blinded by what could be a funny idea? Yeah, I think I was. I mean, I don't want to call Trump inspirational in any way, but um, <laughs> he, because it was so hard to get every little, like, sniff and every little, like, um, and he didn't talk like a normal person, no, you know what no, I mean? No. Like, he has weird, like, pauses and things like that. I had to do them over and over again. And then every time I did them, that repetition, yeah. I would think of something new. And it mm -hmm. was like this little playground of like, oh, I, maybe I'll actually use, you know, my dog's toy for this mm -hmm. lobster video, you know, maybe I'll do this, you know, this, you know, blind mask thing, you know, with the <laughs> Lone Ranger thing, you know, and I, I, so those, because I was alone and I was listening to it over and over again and I was just like letting my mind go, like those, that's kind of where the ideas came from. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you got introduced to the comedy world as a whole, by way of these videos, did you feel like you had to fight harder to stay in that room? And alone, you mean? <laughs> you mean? I just mean in the comedy entertainment sphere. Did you feel like people were putting you in a box of like, well, she's a lip syncer, she's oh. a TikToker, mm -hmm. she's a, you know, she's, she writes articles, she writes listicles, mm -hmm. whereas you wanted to say like, I'm just a creative thinker, I'm being foolish, I'm being silly, I'd like to be a comedic performer in a lot of realms. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, um, when, I was, when I was doing those lip syncs, like, I sort of became this different person. And so I think I, had, I was having this identity crisis because I think people wanted to see this very in charge, sort of like, you know, uh, clueless boss kind mm. of thing. That's the clueless boss sort of character. And so I didn't know. I was like, who am I really? Like, am I, what, can I be Trump without being Trump? Mm. You know, I don't know how to do that. And yet I kind of do know how to do that because I worked at Google. You know, like <laughs> I've seen a clueless boss over and over again. Um, <laughs> so um, it took me a while. To, I think people were like, no, you are a lip syncer. And I was like, you're right. I, that's all I can do. I don't know what else I can do. Um, so it took a while and also going through all these, you know, motions of, trying to figure out who I am to be like, no, I, I, there's so much more I want to talk about. There's so much more I want to say. There's so much more I want to do, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so through this, you get introduced to Jerry Seinfeld. Who? <laughs> <laughs> and it seems like his opinion and also just being in his world is very inspirational to you. <laughs> um, yeah. Um... <laughs> Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, I see this whole thing with Jerry Seinfeld has just been crazy because I, I, I watch Seinfeld. I used to fall asleep to Seinfeld, you know, like, um, and, you know, you watch him back in the 90s with this poofy hair and his, like, dad jeans. You're like, he's kind of cute, you know, um, <laughs> and, uh, and he's got this really iconic voice and then one of the, he was one of the first people to share my videos. Like, he was talking about me in the New York Times, and he was like a dad mm. telling his children, this is funny, this is funny. <laughs> um, and um, that, 
that was kind of it. And then, you know, a few years later, I auditioned for this film, and um, I get the part. And I, I just never in a million years did I think I would ever do that, you know. And um, to have to ha to literally have Jerry Seinfeld in front of you, talking to you with the voice, being like Sarah, is just like it's, <laughs> it's just an out of body experience at first and the whole time. Um, <laughs> But um, he's like, I just admire him so much, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it, I met so many people, you know, and I, t I keep trying to tell myself this. Like, I met so many people, huge people, people that I admired for years and years and years, and yet for some reason he was the one that I lost my head with, like, completely. Like, just completely became the most neurotic version of myself yeah. I, I've ever seen in my life. Um, and you know, it also goes back to daddy issues. But um, <laughs> I will say that, you know, the thing about, the thing about Jerry that I, I loved so much was uh, how rich he is. No, um, <laughs> no, I love that he, he's so chill. Yeah. He's just so chill. He's so confident um, and he's so relaxed and he's so like, whatever happens, happens. You know, he's, he's, he's that guy, you know? It's like whatever happens, happens. And it's like that's, it, it's the only way to really have fun is to be like whatever happens, happens. That's the only way to, if you have, you have to let go of, of it has to be this, it has to be this, it has to be this. If, it, if it's not this, it's going to be a failure. You have to let go of that. And he just seems to have completely let go of that in a way that I just really admire. Yeah. Also, he has a lot of cars, which I think helps. Yeah, he does. He does. Also, I, I heard he meditates, but whatever. Yeah. So when you were, because you were the baby yeah. of your family, do you think that it took a long time for your parents to like get you or understand who they thought you were? And now that you're showcasing so many parts of your personality in public, do you think they get you more now? Um, no, <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think they... Um, <sighs> My parents, I, I, you know, they, I'm just, I love digging into things. I love, like, exploring things, like, really just every, like, iota of everything. And my parents don't. They just don't. They don't. I, I got my mom to come to one therapy session. And um, <laughs> even after that, she would be like, um, she'd be like, oh, Sarah, are you still in therapy? <laughs> and she would make this motion. How's therapy going? Are you still taking your pills? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what they think of therapy. You know, they think yeah. it's for someone who needs help, who has something wrong with them. I think that's also like in the Jamaican handbook. Yeah. 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 And um, I think it's this beautiful place where you can really get to the heart of things and really mm -hmm. figure it out. And, and yeah, you do get to a point where you're like, maybe I don't want to talk about this anymore. Maybe I've, I've sort of healed this part of myself and I do want to move on. But I, want, I, I had to go through all that. I needed yeah. to go through all that. And they are just like, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like that's their whole vibe, which is kind of ironic because after years and years of therapy, I am literally like, don't worry, be happy. I think it actually is true. Yeah. Like it's don't worry, be happy. You it's found true. it in a I found it. Way. I found it, but I had to find it my, on my own. You know, yeah. it's like the Wizard of Oz. You are, <laughs> it, you are exactly the Wizard of Oz. I am. I really am. So now, what are you excited about? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm excited to hear what your questions are. I know there's going to be like a million of them. People are excited. Um, They're already yeah, raising their hands yeah. a little bit. Um, yeah, I just, I'm excited for people to read the book and I see what resonates with them. I, you know, I just, I, I really love this book so much. I mean, one of the things I really love about it is, is, is the, the parts of it, assimilation, determination, and humiliation. And it took me while writing the book to be like, wow, like th these are my siblings. Like my brother <laughs> is assimilation, navy, married, two kids, house, yeah. dog. Like he is, he follow, he followed every single thing. And then determination is about my love life and my sister Charmaine, who was born with Treacher Khan syndrome, um, has you know always wanted to get married. Always, and we are such a visual society. And Trump is the perfect example of that. Like we looked at him and thought, oh, powerful guy. You know, we did, we weren't listening to what he was saying. Yeah. It took taking away the visual for us to actually hear what he was saying. And so, it it sucks that like 
a lot of times on social media and on dating apps, it almost seems like we're becoming the same version of each other. We all are just saying the same thing and we're, we want to look the same. And, and yet my sister, she looks like no one else I've ever met before and that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I want us to celebrate. I want to be loved for what makes me different, not what makes me the same. Um, and then humiliation, my sister Rachel taught me so much about that because I realized being embarrassed for me is when I take myself and I put myself in your brain and I tell myself that you're thinking I suck. But if I, I don't know what you're thinking, I can never be in it. I can't be in your brain. Even if I was in your brain, it'd still be me in your brain. Like it would still be me looking out of your eyes as me. I can never be you. You know what I mean? <laughs> So why ever assume that people are looking at you in a certain way? You have no idea what people are thinking. So humiliation is something you can actually only do to yourself. You, no one can humiliate you. Um, you. So that taking control of that, because, because Rachel never does that. She never puts, tries to put herself in anyone else's shoes. She's just Rachel. And so um, my discovery sort of of the fact that like who I am is so much based on my siblings. My siblings formed my personality in a way that I didn't see until I sort of wrote this book. And those three pieces, the George, Charmaine, and Rachel, and that's who I wrote this book for, um, are, are really like, they, they kind of made me, you know, who I am, sort of. And also the fact that, like, um, that's, it's, it's Seinfeld. It's Seinfeld again because it's like George is a lot like George and Charmaine is Elaine and Rachel is Kramer. I mean, it's all, and I'm Seinfeld. So, yeah. I get yeah. it. I get it. I see yeah. the parallels for it's, sure. The parallels are there. They're there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you, you learned some really hard truths about yourself by just even going into your Google Docs. Yeah. And when you think back about that, like you say in the book, Google Docs knew that you were getting divorced before you did. Mm -hmm. I first interpreted that to mean like you stumbled upon a secret and your ex-husband was writing a crazy oh, diatribe, right? Interesting. And then when I started to read it, I was like, oh, she's reading her own Google Docs. Yeah. She's reading her own notes of just like various days of your life mm -hmm. and then starting to hear it and realize like, oh, this is like a toxic thing that I was existing in and I was notating parts of it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that was even you kind of reaching a hand out to your future self to say, hey, like, when you come back and read these, yeah. it should be the last time we write this. I never thought about it that way, wow. but I think you might be right. I mean, I thought about it in the fact of, like, you know, a lot of times as a kid when I was in my room journaling, it's because I sort of felt trapped. I felt like I, I couldn't. There was no one I could really relate to, so I would go to my journal. And then in my marriage, I recreated my childhood. Mm -hmm. I, was in, I was in the room by myself journaling yeah. because I, didn't, I couldn't talk to my husband. Um, and it was just easier to write in Google Docs. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, I, we had been fired by a few therapists, so that red flag. But how, um, does that, how does that, because that's never happened to me. I don't want to brag. Yeah, that's a brag. But that's a brag. How does that, how does that conversation happen? What, what does that sound like? Well, the first one... Um, <laughs> was an email. Because um, <laughs> they were really done. Because they were really, they were like, and that was only after like nine sessions or something, and, and he just said, I don't think I can help you. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> it's worse than the pooper scooper. Um, <laughs> and the second one, um, yeah, he, he just, again, but it was a longer time. It, I think he gave us like 25 or something sessions, and then he was like, yeah, I don't think I can help you. And then my ex-husband tried to give him a bad review on ZocDoc, <laughs> and ZocDoc wouldn't let him. Yeah. Like, they, they were like, no. <laughs> yeah, because um, your therapist warned them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they said he's coming. So, so, but even still, I was like, well, relationships are hard. Yes. They're hard. Yeah. So, like, it's just part of being hard. Yeah. So, I, you know, I went to Google at, at one point during our marriage, and I said, should I get a divorce? And then the, a quiz popped up. So, I took the quiz, and the quiz was like, you, you're with a great man, so stay with him. <laughs> so, I was like, okay. Saboteur! Yeah. So, in the book, when I finally was like, well, I took the quiz. The quiz didn't work. Um, I was like, let me look at you know, my own, what, I, what I've written. And so I went to Google Docs and searched Journal Jeff, and it pulled up all, everything that I'd written about him. And I just wrote the same thing over and over again for like eight years. And yeah. I was like, it was like the end of a movie. I was just like, whoa, this is, this is 
proof right here. And I needed that. I needed that proof because I really thought I just needed to work harder. Mm. I thought I just needed to work harder. If I didn't see it right there, like how miserable I was, I, I don't know if I could have left him. Yeah. That was really powerful that you did that, especially because you have you had tried a lot of other tools already. Exactly. You know, you're yeah. writing about it. You're just firing therapists left and right. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're getting a sunny apartment. You're getting yeah. a, you took them to the clouds. I took them to the you clouds. You moved into the clouds. Yeah, I did everything. It's very Google of you, you know. Yeah. You had tried everything. So I, I think in I, earnest. I literally wrote in my journal, um, I feel like if, even if I make a ton of money, he still won't be happy. And I was making a ton of money at that moment, yeah. and he still wasn't happy. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is it. Yeah. Because so I thought, because he was working and I wasn't working, and I, the comedy thing wasn't going that well. Mm. And my mom was like, "Wait, he's making the bacon and bringing home the bacon. <laughs> he's doing all the bacon. Um, <laughs> he he's gonna leave you." My mom literally said, "He's gonna leave you mm. because you're doing nothing." And so I was like, "I gotta make money or else he's gonna leave me." Yeah. And I, but I wrote in my journal, "Even if I make money, I bet he still won't be happy." Yeah, and, and I mean, wasn't. at that point in your life, the work that you would have had to done to try to even like compete with him would have put you down a whole other path, right? You know? Yeah. And I mean, I can speak from my personal experience. I have dated people who were more successful than me and less successful than me, especially in entertainment, and it's the same issues, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It doesn't matter how much power they have, how much money they have. They, if they have some type of insecurity or issues that they haven't worked out, they're gonna push that off on you no matter what. They'll do it to you, they'll do it to anybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing is that I felt like he was very competitive with me. Um, and then it took me a while to realize I'm a competitive person too. My comp competition just comes out in different ways. But I don't want to be with someone who I feel like I'm in competition with. Yeah, in an know? unhealthy way. In an un is there a healthy way to be in competition? Absolutely. I think, I think spouses can have healthy competition. What do you guys think? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just an ah uh is a no, for sure. I do think it's possible if you can motivate each other and keep each other accountable through certain goals, yeah. plan for things together. I think you can be competitive in that way, but it shouldn't be. I bet the Obamas are competitive with each other. You know? Yeah, I bet you're right. You know? Yeah. I bet they are. I bet they are. <laughs> I bet Michelle wins, but I bet. Not at basketball. <laughs> not at basketball, yeah. not anymore, no. <laughs> <laughs> so now do you feel like you have a different outlook on love? Yeah, <laughs> not a good one. I, um, yeah, I, I got I got pretty cynical. I'll be honest. I've been I've been pretty cynical lately about about love. But <clears throat> I think my ideal relationship is, um, you know, a sixty eight year old comedian. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> Lots of cars, <laughs> if no. you know anyone. No, but I just, I, I love my life so much. I really love being single. I really do. I, yeah. love, I love being on my own. But, um, you know, it would be nice to ha be with someone else who also loves being on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, I just love, like, two very independent people who are sometimes together, and then, they, and then they're together. And yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, that, that's kind of my ideal thing right now. And maybe I'll find it, and maybe I'll just have a bunch of friends, and that would be great, too, you know? Either way. Yeah. Either way. I love that you have peace with, with either. That sounds helpful. I have so much peace. Ah, <laughs> so much peace. <laughs> so much peace. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. Foolish is an incredible book. I encourage you all to read it if you haven't. Finish it. Read it. Sarah Cooper is your best friend in your pocket. She's giving it to you. <laughs> She's giving it to you. Um, Chanel, I think this has been so great. Thank you oh, so much for so doing great. this. Of course. You're oh, my awesome. God. It was such a pleasure to read this. I was on the train on the way here today, and I laughed out loud while reading the book. And this lady next to me was like, ah. Oh, I love it when a good book makes me laugh. And it pissed me off. It pissed me off. I really felt like she was reaching. Um, but also, she, she caught me in a moment that was so genuine. So, yeah, thank you so much for sharing yourself with us. It's really, oh, and we're, we're really proud of you. I'm speaking on, on behalf of everybody and your parents. We're really proud of Aww. you. <laughs> Mom, Dad, thank you. <laughs> I, t I texted them earlier. Um, Hi. Hi. Um, your sister's name is Rachel, and I didn't know that but I felt like you were speaking to me, so I, I claim it. Um, <laughs> Your name is Rachel? Um, Rachel? It is. Hey, Rachel. Um, so as a that person, would be so funny if her name wasn't Rachel. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so as a person who um, often felt like showing up in spaces where, um, you know, you're sort of this veneer, what advice would you have for just claiming in that bravery and being authentic, authentic to yourself um, and not asking for permission anymore? Yeah, I, I, I noticed that, that the journaling really has helped me figure out exactly like who I, who I am, what I, what I want, what I think about things. 
Because if you don't even know what you think, it's hard to open up. It's hard to, to say that, you know? So I, I feel like knowing is the first part, knowing exactly how you feel and what you think. I've even gotten to the point where sometimes I'll just be having conversations with people and I'll think to myself, what would I journal about this moment? And that'll help me realize, okay, how, how do I really feel about it? Um, and then it's just taking those little moments. Each of us have a moment all probably, I don't know, I have, I have a ton of moments all day where I'm like, I want to say this. Should I say it? Should I do that? I don't know. Every time you want to do something and you shut yourself down, it's, it, it's, it compounds. Then you just want to keep shutting yourself down. So it's like, it's taking that little like, oh, I actually don't like the fish. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them that I don't want fish. You know what I mean? Do it. Say it. Like those little tiny things that you want give yourself permission to actually voice those things, and then it'll get easier and easier to like ask for the bigger things. Um, although, you know, I couldn't, ask the, I couldn't ask for the linen closet. It was easier for me to ask for the divorce than to ask for my linen closet back. <laughs> um, but once I asked for the divorce, and I will say that that was, it was the most powerful moment in my life, but also like, it, the voice that came out was just like, so weak and so small, but it was the most powerful thing that I've ever done. So like, it's okay if like your voice is weak at first, you know, and that's okay. Um, it'll get stronger the more you use it. So it's really just practicing it in those small moments as much as you can. Yeah, thank you. Wireless mics. Hi. So I'm also named Sarah. <gasps> I, I really don't like spicy food. Oh. <laughs> and, like, I, no, Sarah I to, does. I don't think I there's a to single Sarah. To a friend. I was like, I'm a super taster, and she was like, "That is the whitest thing I've ever heard." <laughs> <laughs> but so my question is, like, do you think that hitting 40? gave you any of that like feeling of like whatever happens happens because I feel like for me hitting 40 was like oh I didn't do all the things I was supposed to do but like it's too late to do them now so I can just do whatever like is that did that did you feel that at all <laughs> um well I feel I, I personally feel like I'm 10 years behind and in, in so many ways like I'm 45 now which I still can't believe and none of you can believe it either um and um shocking shocking to everyone um you know, I think now I'm starting to get there. Like, now I'm starting to get there. Before, I think I thought I was like that, but I was still doing everything by the book. I was still following a script. Um, so, yeah, but what your, your 40s are, uh, it, things do get real. You know, your parents start to get older. You know, it's, the light is coming. You know, <laughs> like, it's, 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 getting, it's, it's getting darker. Um, so, yeah, I mean... It, it does give you a burst of confidence to take more chances, knowing that you're, you, the chances are, you can kind of see that like, the chances are much more precious. So yeah, I totally see that, yeah. So as a therapist. Oh, <laughs> oh no, she's gonna fire you. <laughs> oh no, she came here to fire you. This is all a setup. <laughs> I've never been fired by an individual therapist. Ooh, talk, Only talk a couple. Of okay, that's a, that's a new credit. I'm not here to fire anybody. Okay, thank God. <laughs> but I am a therapist. So my question to you is: Are you gonna have another show? Hmm. Another show? Yeah. Because yeah. you got you really got me through the pandemic. Yeah. I want to. I want to. I think that um, I. It it. Like I said, like I'm just now figuring out like what I really like, what makes me laugh, what what I you know what I laugh out loud at, and so um, now I feel like I'm in a better position to make something that I would actually enjoy, that I would actually watch, that I would love to like do for a really long time, and so hopefully I'll get that opportunity. And if people like you and you and you all keep supporting me and as much as you have, which I want to thank you so much because literally without you sharing my videos and talking about me and being here, you know like. All of this has helped me live this life that I'm just so in love with now. So I'm hoping very much to have a show. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I know you. you can't tell us, but are any of your patients TV executives or? Yeah. <laughs> okay, That's well, what you need to do. Anytime an executive comes in and asks you, you know, what they should do with their life, say, give Sarah Cooper a show, you yeah. know, like that. <laughs> Prescribe it to them. Yeah. 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 Uh, what do you think, Sarah, about? Trump having a gag order uh, placed against him. And while you were kind of mocking him, which we loved, uh, <laughs> have you gotten any calls from the Proud Boys or anything like that? Oh, no, <laughs> no. Good. I, um, I, I, so many people are like, 
are you okay? Like, is, did someone come after you? Like, <laughs> anything? Like, no, no. Actually, the people who like Trump also like my videos. Um, yeah. Sadly, I don't think they knew I was making fun of him. Um, <laughs> I genuinely It's a don't. percentage, definitely. It, what do you think, 60-40? No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think he might have even enjoyed the videos, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> he was probably watching him like, oh, I think this he girl like, likes he me. He's like, yeah. this girl Sarah's spicy. Yeah. Something about her. <laughs> Jamaican women love me, you know. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, he's just so... I, I say that I just think he's so boring now because I just think he keeps repeating himself. I mean, like, literally, how much can he talk about water pressure? And <laughs> I just don't... Like, it's just old at this point. So, yeah, I've kind of, I've kind of moved on from it. But I literally think I can lip-sync any dude, so... <laughs> <laughs> I think so, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You got me through the pandemic as well as many other people here. Thank but you. my question is, so you spoke very candidly about your family and about your siblings, right? So was there any backlash about the things that you were open and honest about in the book when it came to honest stories about the family? Um, there was a few things that my, my parents didn't want to talk about. Um, and I was like, why did I even listen to them? They're not going to read the book anyway. I could have written, <laughs> written whatever I wanted, but... I feel like my parents are one of the last people that experienced the American dream. They came here in 1980 with four kids, two with disabilities, and had, my, my dad was making, I don't know, like $18,000 a year. My mom didn't have a job, and they are retired and have, they are completely fine, and, and, and like all of us have owned real estate at this point, you know? Like, so they really, they were able to do it, but in Jamaica, they only had one pair of shoes, each of them. They lived in, my dad lived in a very, very poor rural area um, of Jamaica with his grandmother, and that, that was it. It was a shack. Um, and so to come from that to where they are is amazing, but they didn't want to talk about that. They actually, I, I don't know if there's shame there or what it is, but they really didn't want me to, to, to talk about where they came from in, in a way that, like, I wanted to. So... There was that. Um, but the, also, the other thing that I, I have to say is that, um, you know, when I was born, my sister Charmaine told me this, and I had never heard, no one in my family had heard this story before, which is that when I came back from the hospital, she looked at my ears to see if my ears looked like hers, because she didn't have ears, because mm. that's when you're born with Treacher Collins syndrome, you don't have ears. And so she was desperate to have my ears look like her ears. And when they didn't, she was a little disappointed. Um, and that made me, that really hit me how important it is to see yourself in, in, in the world. Um, yeah. And um, <clears throat> I'd never thought about that before. And um, it, it was just, it, it's just such an interesting moment probably for my mother hoping and praying that I was born healthy and my sister hoping and praying that I was born like her. You know, it's just, um, so there are things like that that I didn't put in the book because bo those were two stories that both of them didn't want in the book. So I didn't put them in the book, but I'm telling you now and this is being live streamed, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's going to be okay. Yeah. That was a great question. I do yeah. think it's really hard to um, share your truth in, in a book and, and also share it with people that are a part of your truth and hope that they understand what you're sharing and the, the yeah. reflections that we've made. Yeah, plus I also think, you know, my previous books were illustrated. This is the first book that I'm writing where it's essays, and um, it's, hard, it's hard to write the thing in the way that you want to, that it will be interpreted in yeah. sort of the right way. Um, and, and so there were, there were topics that I shied away from just because I felt like I didn't have the skill yet to write about them yet, and hopefully I will one day, you know. And, and what about your ex-husband? Did he care you know, the about The wildest this? thing, he asked to see the manuscript, and I emailed it to him, and I haven't heard from him since. <laughs> he got fired from Google, so he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't even have access to that email anymore. Hey there. You guys have been great. This has been very fun. Um, to sort of lighten it up, I'm wondering when you do the, the lip sync videos, like, what's the process? How long does that take? For, I, you see so many people do videos and the lips or the, the lip syncs all off does it take forever mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean it it some i mean i think the first one i did i took a few hours and then by the end i was spending like 12 hours on them like i just i was really being a perfectionist with them 
Um, so it was really just listening to it over and over and over and over and over again. And, um, and I got a kick out of trying to get it perfect as perfectly as possible. I did get a kick out of that. Yeah. I really enjoyed when you would share a draft of another one. Yeah. And you could see the subtleties and the differences, yeah. like different decisions you made, yeah. different emotions that you evoked. Like just really, you could see your acting, really. Yeah. You know. So I, I do want to say that it was more than just lip syncing. I hope you're not. I hope you're not just telling yourself I just lip synced a little <laughs> bit. You know, because we we've all seen lots of lip syncs, right? Yeah. And there's a difference when someone is committing to every single emotion that the original person is feeling and they're showing it on their face and in their actions and in their body and in their, their, their surroundings, in their situation. You know, it's, it's really, it takes on an art of its own. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of felt like it was really fun to make him look as dumb as I thought <laughs> yeah. he sounded. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> We're really thankful for yeah. it. <laughs> We're thankful for it because without those lip syncs, we would only have the real thing. Right. <laughs> this is uh, less of a question and more of an encouragement. Not that you're looking for it, but I was watching you a couple weeks ago, I think before your bangs. And uh, <laughs> I think it was on Instagram before you went to YouTube. Yeah. But you, were, you got really choked up. And uh, I was like, oh my gosh. I feel so bad for her and you were talking about meeting guys online and that sort of thing so uh, I thought oh she I have to tell her about Lynn and me and this is Lynn and uh, we met on match.com in, oh my in gosh. 2015 and got married three years ago we're oh, gonna wow. have our third anniversary at the end of the month <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> So I just wanted to say, like, you know, well, you can find a good guy. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but you can, you, they're out there, you know. Oh, thank you. Um, so I just felt, I felt horrible watching you. Oh, well, I'm kind sorry get, I made you feel horrible. Uh, no, no, <laughs> no, no, I mean, you know what I mean. Yeah. It's like, I was like, you know, it, it, yeah. it can be better, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, um, thank you for your question. Um, <laughs> um, I, I'm so happy that you guys, actually, Match.com actually worked for you. Yeah. I was on Match.com for so long, and uh, it, it just drove me crazy. So I'm excited that it worked for you all, um, and you all seem so happy. Um, and you're here, so that's great. Um, I, I think... It's okay to be alone too, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think being alone is actually sometimes, I mean, I think I went through a period where I was just like, I really want to be alone um, just to find myself a little bit more. Um, and now I'm starting, starting to open up a little bit more to, to being around people and being with people. Um, but alone time, I, I, I find it very precious. So I, I actually, alone is good for me sometimes. Yeah, but thank you for your encouragement. Thank you guys so much for yeah. your questions. We're going to give Sarah a, a final moment to give us our last parting. We, we can clap in a second. Just hold on. Yeah. Just hold on. Um, thank you so much again for writing this and sharing so many parts of yourself with us. It's um, really beautiful and dope. And I'm going to say the N-word with you later just to celebrate. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna say it for you. Thank and you. We're gonna How celebrate. about you say it and I lip sync it? That's right. <laughs> now there, we, that's an idea. <laughs> Do you have any final words no, about I'm foolish? Good. I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming. This has just been so amazing. It's so wonderful to see all your faces and to meet you in person. And I want to thank you again for all of your support over the past three years or five years or however long you've known me and supported me. Um, you might think you're just hanging out online, watching a video and sharing it, but you might actually be supporting someone's dreams and sharing and changing their life. So I want to thank you for that. So thank you so much. <laughs>